I'm old, I'm married, I'm 26. Old. Yeah, <laughs> but older than the others. So I have more freedoms maybe, or it's just more like freedom, but um, there were actually some rules. Yeah, and I have to stick to the rules. And um, I have thought they would build up my abilities, what I can do good, and they would see, ah, you're good in this, we um, give you, yeah, we train you in that. But actually, they confront, uh, confront me with my weaknesses. <laughs> so, it, the, um, I said, okay, okay, just pass the first week, then it will change. After the first week, it did not change. <laughs> Second week, third week, one month, it was rough for me. I had two conversations with Jay and Matt, talked to them, said, maybe it's too much for me. Um, I, I struggle with handle all the stuff. And it was really not that easy for me. It was rough. I was two times near to cry. <laughs> so that happens the last five years. I don't know how often. But um, in one month, the Bible school did it. <laughs> so, um, and I look for encouragement. I look for leading and um, in the situation where I was very confused and was struggling and felt weak as a little girl, yeah, um, I also called my uh, text message, yeah, with my, yeah, you know, all the yeah. messages, so you know, they got me, uh, with my parents and through the teacher, through Matt and through my parents I got a lot of encouragement. And I learned how important is encouragement. Um, and I love encouragement. And I love to give encouragement. So um, I just wrote down what is my fazit, my summary, my yeah, uh, what I realized. I came to this. I know, I know God sent me here because I prayed for it. I know this for sure. It's my place here in Bible school for now. I am here with a purpose. God prepared and created this character school. I don't like character schools. They are always so hard. <laughs> yeah, but they're necessary. Uh, he designed this for me and my wife, Jana. And there's a reason why I am here and why it is hard for me. For some duties, you need to be prepared, like Joseph in the Egyptian, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this question, so the question now is, do I accept Jesus as my Lord, not just a Savior? also as Lord. I learned the difference here in the school. Mm -hmm. And do I accept the plans of my Lord for my life? Am I ready to give up? And through the encouragement from the teachers and my parents, I was ready to give up. I said, okay, maybe the four months are not the best of my life. <coughs> and maybe they hard, but if this is the position where God want me to be, it shall be. And I am, it was not just, oh, now I have the biggest joy in my life because I give up. No, uh, it was hard, but I had peace. You know? yeah. At this moment, when I gave up, I had this peace. Mm -hmm. And through this peace, the joy was coming. Mm -hmm. And now I'm just happy to be here. Oh, it was yeah. awesome. And I have two Bible verses. Um, Proverbs, I hope I say it right, 3, 5 to 6. Trust. In with all your heart, trust in the Lord. I think I made a mistake. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. And the second is Isaiah 40.10. I loved it. Someone knows that? <laughs> uh, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously. Anxiously. Thank you. Look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Well, it's good to be back with you. Um, as I mentioned, um, Jessica, my wife, and I, um, we've had our fifth child. Little Nicola, or Nico, um, Alexander McClenny. Jess is still recovering <laughs> a couple weeks later, as am I. Um, hope that won't affect anything this morning, though. I'm sure it won't. Uh, but I think it'll fit well with our message. Um, I'd like to start with prayer, and then we'll get into the message that is from 
Daniel chapter 1. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that by your Spirit, you would open our hearts and our minds and our eyes to see Christ this morning, that he would be magnified, that he would be exalted, and Lord, you'd be given a place, there would be application to put something, something into our lives today. I pray, Lord, that this ancient text that some would say is completely irrelevant would, would rock our world, Lord, as we'd see that your Spirit would speak through your word. And Lord, that you would give us a hunger for your word. And um, Lord, I pray that the message would be one not only that we live in the good of, good of, but we'd also go willing to share it. This I pray in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. So if you want to turn to Daniel chapter 1, and we'll be looking there as well as, well as a couple other passages of scripture this morning. When you are a young kid, but I don't think it's just a young kid, um, anytime people are doing choosing for something, I, it takes me back to um, playing sports, a soccer team, a basketball team, a volleyball team. Like, we've got to make teams here. All right? So we need a captain. They usually pick the best person. You're on this side, captain. You're on this side. Okay. And they wouldn't say it this way, but they'd say, now start picking the best players until you're down to the last one. It's worth about nothing, but that's how you'd feel anyways if you're in that place, because you're sitting there and you watch everybody get picked in front of you, and you don't get picked because they don't see the worth and value of having you on the team, and it gets to a point at the end where you're guilty by association because they need even numbers for the team. Well, this morning... I want to tell you that's not how God picks us. That's not how He chooses us. And if you've ever felt like that, then hopefully this morning this message would have you saw your heart and your soul singing to a different tune. So in Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. You get the idea? So the Babylonians have come to take out Judah. Israel's already been taken by the Assyrians sometime earlier, and now the last, there's two tribes that are left, and they are taken. This battle's been going on, and now finally taken into captivity. This has to do with some promises that were made. If Israel wasn't going to be up to the task of being the peculiar people that God had called them to be, to live in rest, to live in God's blessing, then... He would discipline them because God, if you read the scripture, loves us too much to allow us to prosper in disobedience. And so he disciplined them and they will go 70 years into captivity. Funny enough, 70 years happens to be the exact amount of years that they didn't keep the Sabbath once they were in the, uh, the land of Canaan. When I say the Sabbath, I'm talking about the Sabbath year. 70 years. And so he says, my land will have its rest. Bottom line is, they lose a battle, Judah loses a battle, Babylonians are taking them, heading off to Iraq. That's how this story is going. So, then, verse 2, The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands, along with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land, the Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youth and whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding, and discerning knowledge, and who had ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans, which is another word for the Babylonians. So, what can we pull from this passage of scripture? So, if you are not attractive, if you're not intelligent, if you're not good with languages and culture, 
if you don't write so well, if you have any kind of blemish in your life, um, you're not usable. Now, if I was preaching that message this morning, and I'm, I'm guessing there'd be a few people who come from different angles to get me out of here pretty quickly, <laughs> and, and I wouldn't blame you. Because that's not the message, and it's not God's message. But what we look at here is the exact opposite. It shows you how the world will choose. It shows you how the world looks and how the world tries to find leaders and find those with abilities, people that can lead and to help and to guide others. Now, being strong at something, we say strong, that's always relative to those who are weaker than you, right? You think you're strong? I played hockey. I did very well in hockey in a small little town of like 1,200, 1,500 people. <laughs> so I went to another town of like 30,000 people, made the rep team, Barely. Do you understand? It's all relative. But being strong is not something that God will hold against you. But the other side of it, being weak is something that He won't hold against you either. Meaning this, that God sees the things that are deep within you and me. And each one of us has them. We have gifts. We've been fashioned by God Himself in our mother's womb. And we're special to Him. And He has a plan. And He wants to put us into service. So God does not look at us as the world looks at us. And what were some of the things that they wrote here? Good looking. No blemish. Age was important. Even their lineage. They had to be of noble blood or royalty. Because maybe, just maybe, if they have all those qualifications, they might be useful. Now when we look at Daniel, and it's been mentioned this morning, what do you know about Daniel? If we say Daniel from the Bible, what do we know about him? And just the very, very obvious stories that you know. Can you just say those out? Lion's Den. Lion's Den. Fiery Furnace. Fiery Furnace. Who is in the Fiery Furnace? The Lord. Shadrach, Shadrach. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Good. You said their Babylonian names. What are their Hebrew names? Uh, Shadrach, and something. That's good. I don't know. <laughs> don't feel bad if you don't know them. This wasn't a quiz or, a quiz or a test. Um, they changed their names to fit under the Babylonian gods, as well as Daniel had another name. The story is incredibly challenging. And what you know about Daniel, that part of his life, guess what? He had a few blemishes. He probably didn't have his teeth the way he would have when he was younger. He wouldn't have been as attractive because those stories, the Daniel and Lion's Den, he would have been older. He wouldn't have been young and he definitely wouldn't have been in the prime of his life. But he was primed for what God had for him. And how was it that he was made usable? Well, it wasn't any of the things that the world looked at, but they ha he happened to have those qualities. He was endowed with an intellect. You know, they had three years. They said three years, you need to learn how to write, you need to learn how to speak, and you need to be in the court, the king's court. That means perfectly understandable. The king's not going to say, what is he babbling about? What is he saying? <laughs> No, perfect. And you're going to be a liaison to your people and you're going to be useful, hopefully, for other things too. But see, God wasn't just looking at those things. And by the way, God is not afraid of training up people. In any way, we wouldn't be running a Bible school if we didn't believe that there was a point in training up people. Moses was trained up in all the ways of Egypt. He had the best education going. Couldn't have got any better. The day and the age. But God was calling him to part water. Make manna appear each day for how many millions of people? Take a staff, strike a rock. Do you understand? There was many things within that call that were outside of his capacity. And even those things that he thought were inside of it, he still needed to learn a very, very important word. And that is dependence. Dependence and obedience to let those things come together that God's majesty, His power, and His righteousness would be seen. There are some people that their training was on the backside of a desert. 
Amos is one of my favorite. He was a shepherd and he trimmed sycamore fig trees. So he was a good trimmer. I was a barber by trade before I went into the work I'm doing, so we had something in common. He was in obscurity with sheep trimming trees and I was in obscurity trimming hair. And God was preparing me. And there was training there. I could tell you so many things about being in a barbershop, the training for what I'm doing today. As I'm sure Amos learned to wait or run at God's leading and his impulses. Each one of us are getting training, but yet the thing that God's calling us to is far greater than that, than our capacities. And that's why we want to arrange every single day in a way of dependence. He's God, I'm not. I can't, he can. He actually never said I could, he always said he would. That he would be his strength. Faithful is he who calls you and will do it. That means he'll re meet his righteous demands in and through you and me. So the way he's made us is that we would be vessels of his life. You receive the gift that he wants to give of his life to us. Right? Jesus came that we'd have life and life more abundant. A life you couldn't buy, deserve, nor earn. You receive it. It's a gift freely received. It's grace. And then when we have that life, our goal is to make ourselves available that that life that He's given us can now be lived in and through us and God's presence, God's glory. That's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And glory does not mean heaven one day. Glory is the weight of God's presence. And yes, one day we will be with Him and that's our destiny as believers to go there. But Christ in you, Colossians 1, 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory, today is living in the good of that message. And know that I've been made with purpose for him now to live in and through me. So if you feel like you've always been picked last, you've not. But maybe you had expectations of what you thought you should be doing or not doing. And that's where the problem may lie. But if we say, empty slate God, what do you want to do? Your life will be radically changed because God's story that's waiting to be told will be told in and through you experientially. That's his message. Everybody here, there is a story waiting to be told. I pray to God that you know that story. And not just that as an event you understood that you needed a Savior, because you did, but it didn't just stop there. You need him every single day. And so I'm not here to preach a message to say, you need to be attractive and you need to be young and you need to be no, nope. it's not God's message. In fact, the gospel message is not so much for the strong. Because they will not feel that they need a Savior. They will not feel that they are broken. They will have many things that they will put around themselves to guard themselves from the reality that we all need Christ. And He is what makes us work. He is the real hero. Now Daniel was a hero, so to speak, as he made himself available. God did incredible things through him. And Jesus is our hero. And he can do it through us. I want to read a couple verses from Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, but we'll go to 1st Corinthians first. First Corinthians chapter 1. And, oh, I wish I could read so much more, but for the sake of time, I've had to choose just a few. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God, now listen to this next part. It's not a compliment, all right? But it's truth to, to be proclaimed and that we would know. Because... He'll be talking about us. So God has chosen the, um, the foolish things of the world, the shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are wise. And the base things. You might have, He has chosen the things that are not, right? Mm -hmm. That's us. Not too impressive. Perhaps. Others might be impressed with you, and if they are, give glory to God in that. If they see something of worth and value, pro proclaim the Lord. The base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not. So that he may nullify the things that are. 
so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boasts in the Lord. If you have any boasting this morning, I pray that your boasting is in the Lord. Amen. That you could say, you know what? Yes, I showed up, but it's God who did it. And in the Christian life, that's to make sense. And that's to be our normality. That's normal for the Christian life. You show up to work, you make yourself available to God, and there'll be a testimony. You know why? He says in the scripture that we are the aroma of Christ. So nobody gets spiritual right now and checks somebody else's spirituality as next to you. It's not talking about a scent. Do we know that? Yes. Yeah, right. But we are the aroma of Christ in this world. You are a letter being read. What does that mean? Now, it doesn't just mean you got tattoos in your letter, you can be read that way, though I know probably a couple of you have few letters on your arms, and that's all right, I think. I actually don't want to comment on that. Right here. Backtrack a little. But you are a letter. Your life is to be read by the people that are around you. Not that you're powerful. Not that you have it all together. You're transparent. There's a God. I'm in need of Him. I called out to Him as Savior because He was drawing me to that reality. I entered into the good of it, and He makes it happen, and He makes it work. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians, chapter 12. Chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, in verse 9. Paul speaking to the Lord about a particular issue. Chapter 12, verse 9. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses so the power of Christ may dwell in me. Mm -hmm. Daniel interprets some things, some dreams for Nebuchadnezzar. If you read the story, you're familiar with it. And every time that somebody tries to praise him or ask him why, the explanation for his life or the wisdom that he seems to have, you need to read through and see how he responds to that. It's not by myself. It's not that I have anything of me. It's not that I can interpret dreams. What? But you interpreted my dream. No, I did not. Yes, you did. No. I heard it come from you. That's, okay, I understand where you're coming from. That was God doing it in and through me. It was God. I don't have anything of myself to interpret dreams, visions, nations that would rise and fall and times to come. Are you kidding me? I'm blind to those things, but God has revealed them to you and me both at the same time, or maybe he told Daniel a little before. Would I praise you for knowing what I told you? No. But don't praise me for what God told me. I'm just telling you. I'm just the messenger. I'm a messenger. That's what I do. I show up for my work, which is make myself available. And Jesus has spoken through Paul about that, that's a reasonable act of worship. Showing up. Where? Yeah. Anyway. Everywhere. Make yourself available. And like Winnie the Pooh says, I always say this to students, wherever you go, well, there you are. Yeah. Profound. <laughs> but it's true, that's all you got. Where you are. His power is made perfect in weakness. And this is not weak compared to anyone else other than God himself. And if you've been living in a comparing mindset and attitude, that's got to go. No business comparing ourselves to other people. God made them how they are. And God made you how you are. And they're special how they are and you're special. His power is made perfect through weakness. And those are people recognized. There's a God. He's it and I'm not and I will find my right place as a vessel 
special to him, loved, kept, and yes, called. So this morning, I ask you, do you know who your hero is? Do you know who it is that's able to live the Christian life? He is. So let him live that life in and through you. And if you don't know this message, and if you feel God is stirring your heart and your spirit to know and understand this more, find someone that you think does know and understand it. And there's many people that will help you on this journey to understand that which you were truly created for. Now, this last part, I've been actually dreading a little, but I'll still go through with it. I wrote a song, and I'm not really so much a singer. I like to write songs, but I also like to surprise our students, so they didn't know I was actually going to do this either. So I'm going to try to finish with the song, and then Warren will come up after, get some announcements, and close this in prayer. Give me one little second. Thy kingdom come, my kingdom go, thy will be done, your story told. Living faith so wonderful. Abundant life begins to flow from a heart of a buckle in. Amen, let's go.
And as always, composed in the way it was presented this morning, it touches my heart because I, uh, and in the message this morning, I just wanted to share my opinion so quickly, is that, uh, you know, it's true, you know, God is at work. He's doing something and we, sometimes we stop the Holy Spirit because we don't listen to the Holy Spirit. And God is at work in the believer to perform His great, wonderful acts of, of mercy and compassion on people that need to be saved. And so we pray without ceasing and we should um, just consider what the Lord is doing in our life personally, individually, and then as a body of believers. So thanks again. All right, I just, uh, before I close this in